Well, uh, this is David Simon, ladies and gentlemen. And he was standing at the back there watching that episode, trying to remind himself... Which one was which? Which yeah. was which. They all blend together after a while. Um, so you know that that was the second episode, of the fifth series, the final series, yeah? That's, I, vaguely, yeah. <laughs> um, and set in your familiar Baltimore, um, the scene of all the, the series, this is your hymn to Baltimore, really, you know, and what a hymn. Uh, well, yeah, I think it is a love letter of sorts. Um, somebody described it as a conflicted, a letter from a conflicted lover uh, uh, who's got a lot of issues. But, um, it, it, uh, you know, it, it is written with a lot of affection for the city, and if you're from the city, it does translate even, even amid all the, the dystopic imagery. Um, there's, you know, there are a lot of inside jokes there for Baltimoreans that, um, although maybe if, maybe if if it plays for Glaswegians, maybe there, there's a, something going on there between the two. It makes Glaswegians feel good about Glasgow. Really? <laughs> yeah, That's, that was my intent. Yeah. <laughs> Although there are um, many Glaswegians who will say, well, you know, we can we can outdo that. We can take you to parts of Glasgow right. where where these guys in the corners would be bulking. Oh, really? Sh yeah. Well, you know, uh, over today at the BBC, a gentleman was pointing to the river and, and, and all of what used to be the, the quays where, um, where the ships were built. Yeah. And he was speaking about it in the past tense with, with, with just a touch of bitterness and, and, and mm. sort of, uh, you know, real localized anger. And I recognize that as, as being post-industrial Baltimore. As this is where this happened and, you know, this is Beth Steele and this is where, this is where we built a Liberty ship a day. And yeah. These are where we made the uh, the B twenty six bombers for the war, and um, yeah, that stuff is all in in the in the DNA of a uh, of a of an industrial city. So. Astonishingly, the Baltimore Sun, well, they didn't let you film in their offices, but they let you reproduce the offices for for the filming, which seems astonishing. You know, it's, it's hard to imagine another a newspaper in this country saying, "Well, look, you're going to show how venal we are, how bad we are." How prepared we're put, we are to put up with bad journalism. I'm not Here, sure, here's yeah, our I'm not newsroom. Sure, I'm not sure they saw it uh, in all its splendor before it happened. <laughs> uh, but the, I, they were aware of one argument, which was fundamental and which I think won over. Because um, we went to them and asked for permission. I wouldn't have done it without, hmm. um, you know, without their acknowledgement. Um, and you name them too. They're yeah, called the Baltimore, the Baltimore Sun. Baltimore Sun. Uh, I mean, what happened was. They had agreed to let us use the Baltimore Sun for the first four seasons. You know, whenever, whenever any character picked up the newspaper, it was the Baltimore Sun. So they had agreed to be part of this mythical uh, simulated Baltimore uh, for four years. And they had actually editorially praised the show for its, uh, for its depiction of problems mm. and, and, you know, uh, in, in a variety of civic institutions, including City Hall, the Baltimore School System, the Baltimore Police Department. Uh, you know, the, the local, the local uh, unions. Mm. Um, so for them to now say, oh wait, you need to call it the Baltimore Star because we're, we, yeah. we see how you do, um, they would have looked like chumps. I mean, the obvious question to ask is, did you know this was going to be how it would pan out at the outset, or has this developed as you've gone along? Uh, it, it developed faster than, than some people would suppose, but not entirely from the beginning. In the beginning, uh, we went to HBO and we said, we will create a television show that will undercut the network standard of the police procedural. Because I find police procedurals to be a little bit loathsome. Um, catch the bad guy. Yeah. You know, validate. You know, the bad guy's always the bad guy. Yeah, normality resumes. Everything's back hunky-dory. Yeah, the system is flawed. Hmm. They're flawed. And sometimes, it, you know, but it's, it's still workable. And, and hmm. You know, I was just a reporter for too long. I watched the system be the system. Um, so I, I love the idea of undercutting uh, this, this great network standard on American mm. television. And that's what we sold HBO on initially. Yeah. Uh, first, I worked for 12 years as, well, no. <laughs> I worked for four years as a police reporter in Baltimore. Mostly nights, mostly weekends. Uh, my off days were Tuesday and Wednesday. By the way, I was ecstatic for the job. I got hired right out of college. It was like the best job of my life. But that was my plan. Get hired as a police reporter, then write a, then get, uh, they let you into the homicide unit, which was incredible enough, you know. I actually asked the police commissioner in Baltimore, can I go into the homicide unit? I promised not to talk to my paper for a year. 
and I'll write this book about your homicide mm -hmm. detectives, which, hey, they're pretty good. It's clearance rate's pretty high, and you know, and uh, you just let me in, and it'll be yeah. a book. And what do you say? And, he, and the, incredibly, the guy said yes. And so I go into the unit, I write this book, and then I have. Uh, you go into the unit, right? But I mean, you know, that you make that sounds as if it happened overnight. No, it was a mi yeah. no, it was a miracle. It was hmm. it was two and a half years of of hard work, and 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 the detectives, you know. They haze you hilariously, and then eventually they get tired of hazing you, and they let you hang around. And they forget you and, there. And they forget you there, and, and then it, or they kind of forget you there, but they just don't care anymore. Mm. Is probably the best way to say it. And then um, the book comes out, and your agent doesn't know what to do with it, so he sends it around Hollywood. Nobody buys it mm -hmm. because it, it's this thick, and nobody can figure out how to make a movie out of it. Um, and then somebody, me, from the rewrite desk of the Baltimore Sun, says. You know, why don't you send it to Barry Levinson? He's from Baltimore. You know, and, and the agent goes, oh, is he? And they send it to him. And he goes, you know, I just happened to be trying to make a, a television mm -hmm. show for NBC, and they didn't want me to do Diner, which I wanted to do. But this is pretty good. We'll do Homicide. So then you get a guy, an A-list director from your hometown to make your book, and then you go and you write an episode for him. Right. And then he asks you to write another, and then pretty soon you leave your, your newspapers going down the shitter. So, so you end up... <laughs> You know, you end up, so this is good advice. Yes, yeah, so then, and, then, and then you end up working for them and learning how to do television. And then your second book comes out and you take your second book and the thin little read of a resume you have as a television mm -hmm. producer, junior producer, to HBO and you say, I can make this as a miniseries. And they, they say, all right. Yeah. I mean, like once I start telling the story yeah. to people who, who, whose initial question was, how do I get into the television industry? Their eyes glaze, and they, you know they just—they look at you like, "What an asshole!" Because, <laughs> because there's like, you know, there's no replication. It was—it was without a plan. It really was. Yeah.